Thank you to OPT and thank you to the vendors who contributed because uh, we live in a golden age, don't we? We got some of the coolest, or we're all gearheads or we wouldn't be here. I mean, seriously, we get to, astrophotography is a technical art. We take the technical side, which is playing with the gear and getting it working, getting all that stuff together and the best sky conditions and all that. The art side is how we interpret the data and present it. And that's what I'm going to talk about. I'm sorry, I'm going to apologize right now to you. I'm going to lay on some stuff where we're going to give you meat on the bones. A lot of it. I don't expect you to get all of this. This is stuff that I've accumulated through time. But the wonderful thing is, one thing I'm going to say is you're going to need, if you really love this hobby and you want to take your images to the next level, everybody does things a little different. There's nuggets everywhere. Get a hold of all the DVDs you can. Get a hold of all the help you can. It'll really help you enjoy it and definitely see us at AIC 2015. Number one disclaimer. I do not claim that these are mine or the best or that they'll even work. <laughs> but these are some of the methods that I use to produce some of the images um, that I have. My number one, the, the most fun that I have, honestly, is when I get feedback saying, hey, you helped me w enjoy the hobby. And honestly, that's what I'm here to do. So just a little background, my backyard observatory. Um, I live up in the foothills of Northern California in between Lake Tahoe and Sacramento. We have pretty dark skies. It's not, you know, the best like uh, New Mexico or something like that, but they have measured my uh, faintness down to about 29.3 mags per square arc second on some of the stellar stream research we've done. I run two different cameras because, as was pointed out, image scale is everything. I have a 9 micron pixel camera and I have a 12 micron pixel camera depending on the seeing, what I want to do. And of course, a wonderful mount that, it, you know, that's a little overmounted, don't you think, huh? 175 pounds, it's been working for years. I go to, thank God for stuff that I can go to sleep and image at the same time. It's all good. So, I had this wonderful telescope and I buy this great big chip and all of a sudden I take my first image and go, dang, what's wrong here? I don't know if you can see it, but there's this weird arc reflection and these weird smear reflections and the background's pretty bright. That's called sky concentration because I had a special 100 millimeter field corrector built in there. I'm going, you know, that isn't really what I had in mind. The problem is that the big chip sees everything, right? So we had to go through, I made some modifications and I'm saying this is something you may have to do from time to time too. My whole goal is to try and eliminate this stuff before they hit the chip. So this is some of the things I had to do. I had to increase the can size around the secondary. Uh, what I did was, it was, it was pretty high tech. I cut a 50 millimeter square out of a piece of cardboard. I put it back where the camera was, use my eyeball and go, I can see around the secondary. And that means light can get in and do some weird stuff. So after all that, I, this is what I started with. And these are non-calibrated images, okay? And this is what I ended up with. So there's a significant difference. We got rid of that stuff, and now we're ready to go deep and have some fun. Number one rule, get the best data you can. <laughs> I'm sorry. My wife looked at that. Are you really going to do that? I said, yeah. That's because we're all geeks. And because you're laughing, you know what I'm talking about. So I'm a CCD stack slash Photoshop guy. PixInsight's a wonderful program, and, and from our standpoint, at Advanced Imaging Conference, we watch trends, and we're seeing this trend. These are all tools. You know, if you're a surgeon, you got more than one scalpel. And in this case, I think, you, you know, you can't have enough good tools, so it's all good. But this is, I think, in layers. That's just the way I live. So, number one, I'm going to start out in CCD stack. I want to go through a few things that... Um, I try and fix as many things as I can before I get to the finished product because it's sometimes easier to do it here than to fix it in Photoshop. So number one, it, you see some sky concentration. Every field corrector creates sky concentration. It just does. So creating good flats, good calibration is everything. Okay, And you can see I haven't cleaned my chip in a long time. But so far it's working. And what I like about CCD stack is that you can actually blink through the stack and see this stuff. Now, in my professional life, I have a saying that says, 
A presentation without a demonstration is just conversation. So from time to time, we're going to have a, a demonstration. So what will happen here is I'm going to blink through this stack. And you start seeing, a, and watch right in here. If you can see it, you're going to see a dust donut move. Now I take all my data through several nights, sometimes several weeks. And even though I, you know, I, I take automatic dawn flats, sometimes they don't sync up, right? And we get that dreaded, even after calibration, the raised donut. You know, it's like, no matter what, and it's not, not that easy to fix in Photoshop, but I'm gonna show you how to fix it easier later. So I do like to blink through the stack and see the quality of the images. And you know, I, I use a rotator. And if you use a rotator, you're gonna get your best results is if you take your flats to match the, ro the rotation side. That's basic, but believe it or not, I get a lot of questions about that. And in stack, that's real easy to do. You can actually select the areas, east and west, turn them on, and apply the calibration to match. So I built um, the calibration frames already, you point to them, you apply them to the east side and then the west. And, and I know there's automated functions and I know you, hate, you want to get past that calibration phase really quickly, but I really, really like to after it's calibrate, blink through and see what's gonna come through, because I stretch the tar out of stuff, right? I'm looking for star streams and faint stuff, and we wanna make sure that we're not just integrating um, you know, problem stuff. Now, when I'm all done with my particular camera, even with good calibration, I have a bright column. When I'm, and it's an artifact, and you got to fix this before registration. You're going to end up with a whole bunch of bright columns. Well, the wonderful thing I like about, now there's a couple ways you can deal with this. In Maxim, you can actually pre-map this out, and as it um, downloads the frame, it'll pre-process it for you out of there if you want. I do it after the fact because in, in Stack, I have made a pixel map, and I just run this little algorithm and voila, my little column there, when I run it, it looks like it goes away, but it doesn't really. What happens is it set that whole column to what's called missing value. It gives it like zero, like pure black, okay? So next, what we, I do is, and Stan Moore, who wrote this program, he's this genius guy, but he always comes up with really tough words. I'm going to interpolate. Now, it's just a fancy way to say we're going to sample the, the area around it. It's almost like a content aware type thing, and uh, we make it go away. So bang, we run it, pow, it's gone. And I do that right before I do the actual registration. So I've got good, clean frames. Now, if you want, there's several ways to build your pixel map. I don't have enough time here to tell you about them. If you want to email me, I'll send you this little it's just a little uh, script, and all you have to do is go in and say, and find your column and say it's X this and Y that, put it in there, run it one time, and then save the map aside, because this doesn't change normally, okay? So you, you contact me, I'll help you out with that. Now, every now and then, like I say, you get that dust donut that moves around, and you do that, and it's there, well, what I like to do is normally it's not in all the frames. And in stack, it's really easy to fix. You can see I've got an over subtracted and an under subtracted dust donut there, right in the way. Don't care for that. And, but I look and I have several frames without dust. So what we're gonna do is just mark those frames with dust with rejection. Now it's a small area. Now you can get really finite and do the whole donut and leave the whole. This was kind of brute force. We're under data reject. Again, demo. What we do is we grab this pen. He calls it a pen. I'm trying to get Stan to refine this even better, but I give it about 150 pixel size. And I'll just go over there and I'll mark those puppies <laughs> like that. Now that's marked for rejection. 
And once they're marked for rejection, you go in and I'm combining the frames that doesn't have the dust with the frames that do have the dust with the rejected and pow, gone. You know, it's kind of cool. It makes my life easier down the road. Okay, let's talk about, you know, once I've gotten the best data I can um, in this arena, then no matter what, I believe in creating a, a super sharp master luminance. That's my thing. And the reason is, is because we have a lot of things that actually blur our image while it's going on. And deconvolution is one of the first things that I do to this particular uh, luminance image. Deconvolution attempts to restore an image that's been degraded to its original pre-degraded condition, and that's you know, Richard Berry and James Brunel. And it's a cool thing because what happens is, is that all these things that go on during a, a five-second exposure can happen to you. You get wind, you get some you know, guiding errors and that type of thing, and we end up with blurring. A good friend of mine who's spoken at AIC is one of these geniuses, uh, and he's actually mapped the wave front of local seeing. And we, I always wondered why I run fans in my observatory the whole time I'm, I'm, I'm imaging. And the reason I do that is because I noticed a change in full width half max. Well, he actually mapped that. And you could show before and after turning that fan on that you see. <laughs> and you could see the scintillation slow down. So blurring is what happens. Here's an example where they've applied a Gaussian blur to match, and we do want to get some clarity with that. So, but one thing about deconvolution, it'll make good data better, it won't make poor data great. You know, if you don't have good signal noise that was talked about earlier, um, you don't have good sampling, enough information, it will not work very well for you. So if you're shooting, you know, with a, with a four inch refractor, with a nine or 12 micron pixel camera, it may not give you as much result as a high resolution. I live in the high res resolution side. There's a lot of uh, argument about what's the best sampling. I tend to sample on too much information because I'd rather dig it out image a little longer for signal to noise, but I know that information is there. But you can use it with selective precision or you can use the touch of a blacksmith with this particular tool. And uh, let me tell you, you can, but what I did was is every time we looked at deconvolution, we try to get those settings perfect. And that means that our saturated stars weren't messed up or medium stars, but the detail that we wanted to deal with is what we want. I threw that out because I could never get the settings just right. So what I end up doing is I end up doing what I call multi-strength deconvolution layer blending, which is a fancy way to say that we're going to take the best of the sharpness in a particular object and blend it into the original image that where the stars aren't goobered up and that type of thing. You don't mess up the background and that. So here's a little quick thing on deconvolution and stack. One thing that, uh, there's two different deconvolutions, one's called positive constraint, and I use that the most. In this particular image, um, one thing we always want to do is the selection, and we're trying to get how much this thing's blurred. That's called the point spread function. And it will make a decent estimate if you select the right stars. And all of our images have some curvature, right? I mean, you can't make a perfectly flat image. So what happens is, is we, we want a good segment overall, then it'll kind of average that out. So we auto-select the stars to get a good PSF. And then here's some of these crazy, and know that you don't have to worry about writing down every little thing. I think it's cool, but all this stuff is on my website, and you'll be able to see this. I'm just trying to plant these ideas, you know, to give it a try. But this PSF to Moffat, Moffitt, whatever you want to, however you want to call it. What that is, if it's unchecked, it's the raw PSF. In other words, there's not going to be any change when it actually starts to deconvolve. But if you check it, it's symmetrical. It'll try and make it round. Okay, those are the two the two basic things there. So I always I want round stars. So let's see if it it can help with that. 
then the area, the main things from there you want to set is the area around the stars. What's the matrix radius? How far out is it going to look? Stan says that you need to be at least two times the full width half max. So if you go out there and you measure your stars and you're at two, then you want to set this around four. It's a good place to start. Now the sharpen count is the number of sharpened iterations. Well, but it's not exactly. You'll notice that the higher you make that number, it doesn't really, there's a point it doesn't give you any more sharpness. And it has to do with this ratio between the other, other conditions. So I'm finding that somewhere between three and seven is, works out. In this case, I've, I've asked for five. And then the bias subs is one of the, you know, there again, that's a stand, give these things some different names, a little bit easier to understand. But this is this background, the transition between the background and the edge of a star, what they call the wings. So you're, 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 you're giving it the, the size, how many sh sharpness iterations, and where does the star kind of stop? Again, that's once you know your data, it's going to not vary that much. And if it does vary, it's just vary in seeing. If it goes up a full width half mix, max, you can put it up a point or down a point. I'm running that, I think, around 15 there. And then positive constraint. And then what's kind of cool is you can test this. You can take an area, highlight the area, and deconvolve that area only to see what you get. So here's a result after that deconvolution. I went from 4.8 pixels to 3.3. So that's a, that's a pretty good reduction in the size um, for that object of interest. Now I'm starting to goober up the stars, but I don't care because I'm not going to use some of those stars. But what's interesting is this max entropy. Now on this particular object, which is a polar ring galaxy where it's cannibalized another galaxy and it's spinning its contents around its nucleus, there's some uh, area in there I really want to sharpen up. That's my object of interest. So what we do is we look at the, the maximum ADU that's not saturated. In this cut, I measured that center of the galaxy. I'm about 27,000 counts. And that's what I'm going to set. I'm leaving everything about the same. I did lo lower my bias subdivisions a bit because this isn't a star I'm working on. This is the the area around a galaxy, and my number of iterations, and then boom, this thing. What's weird is when you get this thing going, it's very strange. But the result that I like is that it goes out and it starts to do its thing, and you're going, oh my God, you just put a hole in my star and all this weird stuff. But when it's done, it, you come, it comes up with a lot more contrast between the features and the background. And that's what I was looking for here. I wanted to see some of this detail that's buried inside this polar ring galaxy. So when it's all done, you go boom, eventually, and you go, okay, well, that's kind of cool. So there's before, there's after. You see the, the change? Or you're, and that's not only sharpening and, and making the stars smaller, you also can see that those loops around the core have a lot more contrast. So that's cool. So now I've gotten a couple sequences. I've tightened the, the, some of the stars. I've got the, the object of interest detail. Now I go through this little sequence. So I'm going to pre-stretch all the luminances. I'm going to scale them all the same, export them as a 16-bit TIFF file, and then bring them into Photoshop to blend together the results. And the way you do that in CCD stack is that we'll take and we're going to auto scale and start stretching. So you want to watch out. One thing about Stan's program, you got to watch out for clipping. So look at the histogram. Make sure the left side there that you got some shoulder room. So you're going to keep building that. And you do that with the background adjustment. You move that over. And I always like to lower the gamma. The reason is I don't want anything saturated. So I always play with the gamma around 0.85 to 0.95, never leave it at one. I pull it down and then adjust with the DDP stretch because what I'm trying to do is compress that data, show the bright and the faint to a point at the same time. And then when you're all done, you click the apply to all. And now I end up with three frames that are exactly stretched the same. 
So I bring them into Photoshop. I'm going to do blending without wor worrying about brightness values. There's all saved as 16-bit TIFF files, and then bang, we're in Photoshop. Now, again, I'm sorry I'm moving through this stuff, um, but if you go to my website, I've got all this stuff, and if you can get through the narration, step-by-steps uh, and that type of thing. So, sometimes the programs play you, right? Wave the stick until the music stops and turn around and bow. And, and that's what happens sometimes, is that we, we put this stuff together and it can seem so complex, but if you take it a step at a time, it really isn't. So I want to talk about masks. And someone's going to have to help me watch my time because my, my speaker timer went off. So give me a five minute, you know, hurrah. Masks, I believe, are the most powerful way to selectively control areas of your image. If you can master masks, no matter what program that you use, most of them use masks to some extent. Photoshop is a compositing tool. It's a professional co compositing tool. It was made to take a pretty pitch, picture of a pretty model with her hair flowing, and they want to be able to select her and put something else behind her. Okay, that's or build it up a scene in layers. So the channels, panels, and the masks are the big thing. So let's, I'm gonna go through the basics of what a mask is and how it works in Photoshop. Number one, channels, the channels panel. I always have the channels panel out at the same time because I wanna watch my color channels to see if they blow out, and that's where masks live, okay? And channels are pipelines. Photoshop is a grayscale editor. It takes each color and it blends it for you. Masks or channels? That's just to prove I can do a little bit of solar imaging too. It's kind of fun. But it's a grayscale, and if you look in the channels panel, all the masks are in channels. They do not carry any color information. That's the difference, it's just grayscale. So alpha channels are for mask storage. You can have as many of those things as you want. Okay, and they don't take up any room. Layer masks is where you convey the transparency from one layer to another or through a mask. If you want to know where Alpha Channel comes from, all you smart people who know math, Ray Smith won an Academy Award in the 70s for this. This is where Alpha comes from. The Alpha of a particular pixel and the same pixels on the layer below is the transparency algorithm. So that's where the name alpha channels come from if you're interested. So, sorry about the shameless uh, situation here, but I have the channels panel open and the layers panel side by side because again, I, I want that information close by. The alpha channels contain masks and is grayscale. So I'm pointing to one here. It, real simple rules, black protects or black conceals. Okay, everything 100% black is 100% blockage. Okay, it's transparency control, white selects, or it allows 100% white allows 100% through. So the cool thing about alpha channels or masks is that you can turn them on at will. And a control click actually will turn on a mask and it changes it to a selection, the marching ants, right? And then from there, you can actually convey those marching ants into a layer mask just like that. Here's our demonstration. So we alt click, you see the ants going around, the selection. And at that point, there's a little button that says turn selection into a layer mask, add layer mask. Click the button, bam, you have a mask. Okay, so you've transferred that information from your alpha channel to a layer mask. Now you can do some cool stuff with it. What I did here was I took and painted over the layer. And what that means is this paint went through the mask like a stencil to the layer below. Does that make sense? This is, this is an important part as far as how 
masks work in Photoshop. So we had our information here get blended through the stencil, it's pure white, so it let 100% of that paint through to the white paper below. Simple Simon. Now, one of the most powerful tools that came in CS5 on up is, is called the Refine Mask Tool. It allows us to manipulate the mask in very high control. In CS5, they figured out the algorithm on how to select hair. The whole idea about masking is, is selecting the things that you want. Very, very powerful. It allows you to not only manipulate the mask, but see the results real time. You can see the mask itself, and then you can export it as another layer or a document or a layer that's there. View modes. I use the KNL all the time when I'm doing this because I can see the mask or I can see the result real time, right back and forth. You can add and subtract masks. Why would I do that? Well, I've got a star mask, and I've got a, uh, I've got a galaxy embedded in the star mask. And I want to get rid of the galaxy. I can select the galaxy and subtract that mask, leaving a, a star mask and just the background. Or you can select the background only and subtract it. So you can build all these different masks so you can select different areas of your image to manipulate. So when you, here's how you add and subtract a mask. You hover over a particular mask and you use the control key. You see that little box that pops up around the hand? Those are ants, that's a selection tool. So we, we hover and click that. And then when you do the control plus shift key, you see the plus sign show up? That means we're gonna add that mask you just selected to this mask. Note the plus for add. Okay, we got a demo. And again, what we're doing is we will select the first mask with control click. And then we're gonna select, the, now you can see the mask is now active, it's marching ants. And then I'm gonna add it to the mask with control plus shift. Got the plus sign show up, go click. And now you can see that they're both uh, selected. Click the layer mask button. Now you have a mask of both items. You can subtract them and you can do the intersection of masks. And that's mainly for compositing stuff, but if you know how to do this, you'll come up with ways to use it. So this is how you subtract one. One mask is subtracting from the other and that's what you get, you got it. So that's actually pulled out of the mask, okay? I wanted to do it this way versus a, an astronomical object so you could see exactly what's going on. I think it's a little bit easier to understand. Okay, the color range tool is probably the most powerful masking program in Photoshop for selection. And what we can do here is, in this case, you can either use the eyedropper to select, or you can say, hey, I want highlights, I want mid-range, I want the shadows, and, and build masks that way. So in this case, we're gonna select the highlights, and now, you know, you use the sliders, the range, and, and, and you can see the mask being built at, on real time, what you're selecting. But what I like to do is I'll drop down, now look at the grayscale, so you can see this real time and see how you're building your mask, right? And that is even better than that is sometimes I'll do an inverse. So you can actually see the grayscale that's being built there. Make sense? Our goal is to create a high contrast image. In other words, what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to take this part of the galaxy right here and make it easy to select and build a mask from because I want to blend in that high resolution data into this thing. So what we've done here is I've made the mask active. I click the new channel button. Now I've got, and it's called alpha one. Right, you're gonna rename it so you know what's, uh, what it's about. <laughs> Control plus D actually deselects the mask. It's real important. If you ever have a mask selection active and you start to try and do something to the image, 
and you don't see anything happen, that's because you've got it active and you're probably working outside the boundaries of the mask. It's kind of a bummer. Rename the new alpha channel, then right click on it to duplicate it. And the reason we do this is because anything you do in an alpha channel is destructive. All right, so you can make multiple copies as you go along to make sure you've got what you want. We'll normally give it a name so I know what it means. I can select a new channel. You can increase the contrast with levels, with brightness and contrast, however you want to do it. Don't worry about clipping at this point because the whole idea is I'm trying to actually get the, this core of the galaxy as bright as possible. And then there's lots of different ways you can use the, uh, the color selection tool. In this, in this way, I'm doing a self-masking tool called the quick selection tool. It self-masks as you go and it allows you to select with a uh, paintbrush and what you're doing is you're doing control click to add to the mask or alt control click to subtract from the mask. So build the mask. Now once you've got that where you want it, then you're going to go ahead and hit that uh, mask button. Okay, alt key subtracts. Can you see the marching ants okay from back there? Kind of weird from this angle. So at this point, I'm going to refine that edge with the refine mask tool. Again, this is better than feathering. Feathering only takes the boundary in. The refine mask tool lets you expand the boundary, go on both sides of the boundary, and it also has that algorithm for finding hair, which works cool on this kind of stuff too. So now we've got uh, the mask itself we're looking at. You see the view mode? We're just looking at the mask and we've made some refinements, we've shifted the edge, we've contrasted it, feathered it, um, and now we're gonna turn that ma refined mask into a new channel. So I'm selecting the main mask, control click turns on the selection. So now I'm selecting it. I'm gonna hover plus control plus, oh, don't, don't forget that, because what I'm doing now, I'm gonna subtract the stars and everything out of this. Click the new channel button, and bang, I've got my, I have my mask minus the galaxy. Okay? And you can touch this up with a, with a brush or... So now what's cool is I'm really left with a star mask, right? Now, there's my completed galaxy mask, and it's stored in the, in the, in the, in the channels panel right here. My channel's panel, I got all my masks there, so I'm ready to go. Now what do I do with them? Well, first thing we're gonna do is we're gonna dig out the details with it. So I'm gonna take, I've got three different luminances here, one on top of each other. The raw, unsharpened is on top. Then I have the two different deconvolutions, and I wanna blend those results together without boogering up my stars. I want to sharpen that. I've got my max entropy layer and my uh, positive constraint layer, and I'm going to blend this into positive constraint. So blending the core, core details as easy as this is that I'm going to highlight that layer. I'm going to click on the mask that we built and stored. Alt-click to make it a selection. And then we're going to go over and remember that little box down there, turn selection into a layer mask. That's where you actually take the mask selection and turn it into something you can use. Okay? Now we've got this, this, the power that I've taken something that I've stored and say boom, and now all the transparency goes through that mask. So we're refining the layer. I'm viewing the mask itself. And then now my max entropy is blended into the base layer. And now what's great about layers, you've got all your blending modes, opacity modes. You can say, hey, I've gone too far. Let me dial it back a little bit. 
Now we've got a saturated star. I don't want that one. I want one of my old stars. And that's easy to fix because I have it in the original data there. So I can use my star mask to activate it, turns the selection into a map, and you do it over and over again. Refine it, and then turn it into a layer mask. So now I have a master sharpened luminance ready for color. And you can also use the same mask to bring in other types of adjustments. I went out in the Pix Insight, just this good thing for Warren stuff, because I, you know, you gotta be like a uh, shuttle driver or something to be able to figure that program out in a way. But uh, anyway, I, I, I did some uh, little enhancements with this uh, local histogram equalization and then this HDR multiscale, and I liked some of the things that it did. And now I can use those same masks to you know, export those as TIFF files and bring them into Photoshop and then blend that in to the results. And it ends up pretty decent. Okay, so now I've got everybody with deer in the headlights. Because how many of you feel like you got, a, hey, mask might be a cool thing now, right? Is it something that you're interested in learning? It's, once you get the concept, swear, it's, it's easy. And you can go to my site and I have, you know, the step-by-step -step to do this. So I'm going to do the same thing here. You guys don't know what the ring nebula looks like, right? So I can take that object and I blended it. I actually broke it into three different parts. You've got the core details, right? You've got these petals that are on the outside and then there's a, a very unknown big loop around this whole thing. It's about, eight, eight, about 15 arc minutes out. That's an 03 ring that um, I shot a couple years ago and some professionals are trying to verify that it's real. But I was able to enhance it so you can see it. So we'll see how that goes. So I've got the, right now there's the core details and then there's the pedal details. So I've blown out the other and all I care about is I've got my pedal details. I have my, my mask that's stored in an alpha channel. I apply it. In this case, it's inverted the mask because remember why? White reveals, black conceals, right? So what I want here is I'm blocking my core details, but I'm letting through the petals. But, I, but it's not a very good blend, right? Never fear, refined mask is here. So refine the mask. This, I think, is pretty dramatic to me. I'm using the K to look at the mask. And to see the edge detection, that's the hair. That's the hair algorithm. So I, I, I run that up so it can start detecting the little filaments around the nebula. See that? Boom. It's found those things. And it's doing a good job of cr creating a grayscale of that detail. So I'll do a little adjustment, then I'll, look, I'll use the L to see it in real time. And I'm going, hey, the blend is starting to happen. That's starting to look like something that I like. I'll shift my edge and I'll watch. The edge shifts and you can even see it brighten as it goes. So that's a pretty decent way to blend those two things together. It's destructive to a single channel. So what I can do is I can I don't know if you can read that, but you can actually output where it says output to. You can say, I'll put this to a new layer with its own layer channel and with its own mask, okay? And then you can just delete the other one if you want. Or you can use it. Sometimes two or three of these things with opacity changes can really make a great transition. So now we got the ring core details blended into the petals, bang, bang. And here is, a, I don't know if you can see this, but what I did was I used a background mask to be able to enhance, that's 36 hours of 03. And this, this loop around here, see it's, it's bipolar. In other words, it's stronger here than here. Full loop of 03 um, around the ring. And was able to grab that, enhance it so we can see it. There's a lot of beautiful images out there 
of just the ring and the pedals and that kind of thing. My goal was when I first started seeing this, since it was something new, I couldn't find it anywhere out there. And like I say, we've got a couple of planetary scientists looking at it, and they believe it's real. It could be one of the first puffs of the, of the planetary nebula coming off. So I do say if you invest the time to learn masking, I guarantee you it'll help your images down the road, whether you're using PixInsight, Photoshop, or whatever, you can learn those concepts. And a little free advice. Um, everyone's worried about the APOD and you know that kind of thing. Don't be in a hurry to post. What happens is, um, you know, I am picky. I will zoom in three, because I know my buddies are going to. They're going to zoom in three or four hundred percent, and they're going to look, where did Ken mess up? It is, right? We're, we're not competitive. <laughs> Take your time. Make sure that it's as good as you can get it. Zoom in, look around, make sure your noise is taken care of. You know, there's lots of ways to do I couldn't get into how I deal with that kind of stuff, but you know, it's on my site. Don't be in a hurry to post, and please, please remember this is for you. This is not a contest. If you're happy with the image and you like it, that's what it's all about, right? So there's some free online tutorials about a lot of this kind of thing. At Imaging Deep Sky, I have even some solar processing ones if you're, if you're so in it. If you can make it through the narration, it's all cool. How am I doing on time? Am I over? Two, three minutes. Okay, man. Professional practice presentation. Right? You got it. Thank you so much. Live long and process, huh?